Father, we are so thankful for your love and grace and kindness that is on display at the cross of your Son, and thank you for your preserving of our soul. Thank you for holding us fast. Lord, we, um, we know that we are called to persevere. We are called to endure. We are, we are called to strive, and we are called to fight, to kill sin, to walk, to run, and to run and not grow weary. And all of these commands, Lord, underneath them all are you, the God who has all power, all ability. If we obeyed one single command in Scripture, it's by virtue of your ability and your power and your goodness. It's because your ability to hold us fast. And so we just thank you for the opportunity to sing these lyrics as we praise you this morning. As we praise you on a day where we celebrate Psalm 119 by reading it and examining it together. I pray that you would glorify and honor your word. Uh, even answer the prayer of this psalm that you would show us wonders in your law. That we would meditate on you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may grab a seat. And I want to ask you to uh, grab your Bible and open back up to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And this time I'm going to have you stand as we read it. <laughs> I'm, glad I, I'm glad you laughed, because if you didn't laugh, I'd have to look up and tell you to sit down. So, You know, as I was thinking about how to introduce um, a section of Psalm 119, my heart turned to some figures in church history whose life, whose lives serve as a real testimony of the power of the word. And um, I'm going to look like the uh, plagiarist this morning because uh, I picked two men <laughs> and they were both referred to in the communion message by Matt Kelso. Spur in the same order even, Spurgeon and Luther. There's a book by Ian Murray called Spurgeon versus Hyper-Calvinism, and its first chapter is a chapter of such practical importance that I try to go back to it every year in my own life, in my own heart. The, ch the title of the chapter is A Life of Testimony to the Word of God. And Ian Murray is kind of asking the question, how does a man like Charles Spurgeon, a man who, who wrote over 60 volumes of, of, of sermons and uh, was just notably... Uh, just uh, the greatest orator probably of the 1800s in Britain. And he asks the question, how could somebody have such incredible influence over such an incredible amount of time? And so he says it this way, the obvious question is, how could any man retain such influence over so many people through such a long period? How can we account for the enduring interest? How can a man speak so often and write so much without losing his freshness and his appeal? It is true, Spurgeon possessed unusual gifts and that he worked very hard, but we cannot get anywhere near the real answer if we think merely in terms of what he was or did. The explanation lies in the book that was in his hands, the book that was his constant companion and which he lived to preach and study. All the blessing he attributed to that source his own thoughts, his own opinions would have achieved nothing. And that's so true. Whatever Spurgeon would have been and whatever he was and however he was used by the Lord, it was owed to this book. My copy, I put the Word of God on the spine. The Word of God, it's his very speech. It's his message to us. It's his heart and his mind on display in this book. It's, it is a book, but it's a book unlike any other book. It's a living book written by the one and only God who created all. The same could be said for Martin Luther. Martin Luther had a profound influence for the sake of the gospel. Um, Luther said this. He said, for some years... I have read through the Bible twice every year. If you picture the Bible to be a mighty tree and every word a little branch, I've shaken every one of the, these branches because I wanted to know what it was and what it meant. 
And he just describes his relationship with the Word of God as a massive tree with so many branches and so much fruit. And he looks at every tree, every branch, every fruit. He looks at every leaf. He flips it over. He examines it. He wants to know how it works. He wants to know everything about it. And he's just studied and devoted his life to studying this book. And when we say the Word of God, that starts to become a little bit colloquial, and sometimes it's helpful to slow down a little bit and just to remind ourselves this is God's speech, His expression. It's the uncovering, the unveiling, the revealing of His own heart and mind. It's personally manifested in His Son, who is the Word. Ever since Christ rose from the dead, The church has gathered on the first day of the week, Sunday, the day of his resurrection, to devote ourselves to his word. We shouldn't be surprised that we devote ourselves to this book. It's appropriate that we devote ourselves to his expression, to his word, because whenever God speaks about any issue, we better pay attention. How much more, then, when God speaks about his speech? That's what we have in Psalm 119. We have God speaking about his speech, talking about his own talk. And this is a profound psalm. It's a, it's a psalm that in almost every verse, there is a reference to the word or a synonym for the word. If you include the synonyms such as law, testimony, precepts, ordinances, statutes, commandments, judgments, Word in the sense of message and word in the sense of promise, two distinct Hebrew words. It's just virtually every single verse talking about God's own self expression, God's own word and revelation. I was thinking about this. I mean, this is a, this is kind of a, it feels like a holy of holies. I mean, there's a sense where you could, I could say that every Sunday and it wouldn't be overspeak. But there's also a sense where it does kind of feel unique on a, on a morning like this. I mean, here we are at Grace Bible Church with a congregation that has a massive appetite for God's Word, and we've got the Bible on, on the wall out back. And here we just read Psalm 119, a psalm devoted to God's own speech about his speech. How should we think about God's Word? We need to know what God thinks about his Word so we can think rightly about his Word. So this is kind of a holy of holies. And I thought about it, you know, if you think about it from just kind of a systematic standpoint, you can pick some really important doctrines and think about some of those climactic passages that talk about those doctrines, like the doctrine of creation, what Genesis 1 and 2 is to the doctrine of creation, or what John 17 is to inter-Trinitarian relationships, or what Romans 3 is to the doctrine of atonement and propitiation, or what Romans 9 is to the doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation. Psalm 119 is to God's word. It's captured the hearts and minds of worshipers, and what else could we expect when the one that we worship decides to speak about his speech? William Wilberforce had it memorized, and he would often recite it on his walk to Parliament. And it's just captured the hearts of Christians and the saints, since God has begun saving man, since he has written this incredible psalm. I want to give one more illustration of how important this psalm is, because that's, we could say that, um, you know, about several portions of scripture, but specifically, and from a historical standpoint, Psalm 119 has had a profound importance. Um, Martin Luther, when he published his German writings, he wrote a preface to those volumes, and he could not get away from Psalm 119. In that preface, he basically said that he could have wished that his works would have remained in obscurity. He he said, I could could have wished that it really didn't get a lot of traction, but that if we translated the Bible into German, that would have been enough. He even says in the preface to his German works, I kind of thought that when we got the Bible into German, it would have actually decreased the writing because we would have been devoting ourselves to the Scripture. It would have increased our studying and reading of the Bible, and there would have been less writing. (laughs) But it seems as though the uh, hostility and the enemies of the gospel required even more writing. And he goes on and just even says, although there is some profit in older writings, he, he says the loss of a lot of older writings shouldn't cause us any regret because all that matters is that 
if something's written, its, its value is entirely and only in how well it helps us understand the Bible. And that's really the only reason to read something besides the Bible, is to, it should help you understand the Bible, because this is God speaking. And so what he does in his preface to his German works is he just says, I want to point out to you a correct way of studying theology, for I've had practice in that. If you keep to it, you will become so learned that you yourself could, if it were necessary, write books just as good as those of the fathers and church councils. Even as I, in God, dare not presume and boast, without arrogance and lying, that in the manner of writing books, I do not stand much behind some of the fathers. Of my life, I can by no means make the same boast. This is the way taught by King Holy David. Now, of course, he's going to ascribe Psalm 119 to David because it's in the, in the Psalter and doubtlessly used by all the prophets and patriarchs in the 119th psalm. There you will find three rules amply presented throughout the whole psalm. And they are prayer, meditation, and turmoil. Those are his three prescriptions. If you want to learn how to study theology, he says you need to look no further than Psalm 119 to learn how to be a theologian. And from Psalm 119, you learn that you need prayer, meditation, and suffering. You look at this psalm, it's, it's, it's just patently true. In fact, when we read this psalm, it's probably clear to you that the entire psalm is a prayer. It's directly to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is in the second person. The, the, the author is not writing about the Lord. He's not speaking about the Lord so much as he is speaking to the Lord. It, it, it is a prayer. It's an expression of prayer straight to the Lord. Uh, so if I were to create an index of how, where Psalm 119 talks about prayer, just write down roughly verses 1 through 176. <laughs> now, if you want to think about where this psalm talks about his second instruction for how to become a theologian, and that is um, meditation. Let me just grab a few as by way of example. Look at verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. Look at verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. And there's even a cause and effect relationship there that if he has a proper understanding of God's precepts, his instructions and procedures for how to live a godly life, the result of that will be an increasing meditation on God's wonders, because the more intimate and righteous his walk is with God, the more profound his meditation will be on the character of God. Look at verse 36, and this is the stanza we're going to be in this morning, the hey stanza. Verse 36, he says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. And that's not doesn't use the word meditate. It doesn't speak directly of meditation, but it, it, it describes the heart bending, inclining, like, an, like a magnetic attraction, the heart going in the direction of God's testimonies. And, and that's an aspect of meditation, is when, you're, when your heart and your mind bend that direction, I go the direction of what God has said in his word, then that meditation happens when your heart is bending that way couple more that actually use the word. Let's skip over to verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. The psalmist says, I love God's law, and you think about, and you meditate on, and you consider what you love. He can't help but meditate on God's law all day long because he loves it that much. Verse 148. My eye anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. And that's pretty sweet. You think about, man, the night watch when everything is just slows down and there's really nothing to do except just keep watching. There's no one awake and you got your time and thoughts to yourself and you can just be undistracted so that you can think about God's word. So you can meditate on God's speech, his expression to us. Meditation is, of course, a critical part of a relationship with God and being a theologian and thinking rightly about everything and anything that God wants to make known to us. The third quality that he mentioned was suffering. And let me just show you a few examples. Go back to verse 50. Verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction. 
that your word has revived me. I mean, this is a source of comfort to the worshiper when we are afflicted that we see, regardless of the intensity of the inner turmoil, an even greater power of the word of God to cause life in the soul. Look at verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It's hard for me to, I, I really don't know that I have the ability to read that verse without thinking of the example of a dear friend named Rob Silcox, who came to my apartment from a halfway house and was radically saved from drug addiction. And 10 years later, after five years of marriage, was dying of a second round of battle with cancer. And he came over to my house about two months before he passed, and my boys were there in the living room, and I just said, hey, Rob, tell, tell the boys what your suffering has taught you. And he just didn't even hesitate. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. <laughs> the psalmist is boasting here of the goodness of the Lord that we just heard from Nahum 1.7. And he's boasting of the goodness of the Lord in the affliction. How good is God to afflict us? He is infinitely good to afflict us. Because look at the result that I may learn your statutes. There are statutes that we just would not learn without suffering. And so God is so good to teach us. Look at verse 83. And though I become like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your statutes. I mean, here is, the, here, here is a mature expression of worship where the experience and the sensation of this kind of turmoil, um, you know, Luther used the word anfektung. It's like his, his personal turmoil. It can, it, it can be used for temptation. It can be used for incredibly oppressive circumstances. And here the psalmist is saying that my experience, the sensation I feel when I'm in those kind of circumstances, it feels a lot like a wineskin in the smoke, like some sort of really old, dry, crusty piece of leather, like a golf glove left in the garage for two decades in the Arizona summers. And you pull that thing out, and it's just, just cracked, and it's just, wow. He's like, that's what it feels like. My life feels like that. And even though my life might feel like that, even then I do not forget your statutes. What an incredible, incredible blessing to learn theology in the, face, in, the, in the face of the furnace of affliction. As you're experiencing that incredible a degree of turmoil that in spite of the degree of turmoil you might be experiencing, to see an even more prevailing tendency to say, regardless of my misery, I would rather be obeying God's statutes. Look at 143. 143, trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. I mean, in the face of personal misery, there is a surpassing delight in obeying God's commandments. This is a powerful psalm. It's an incredibly powerful psalm, and we could go on and on. We could pick doctrines, about the word of God virtually at random, and you're going to find it developed in Psalm 119. If we just put every attribute we could name of the, of the scriptures, and we just put it on the, on the wall, and you started throwing darts, we could take the time and start working through the 176 verses and find out what the Psalm 119 says about that aspect of God's word. Perfection, clarity, certainty, the righteousness of God's ordinances, all of these uh, attributes are developed in, not just in some sort of dry, systematic fashion, but in the, in the living context of this expression of worship because of what it means for God's glory and what it does for the believer. 
perhaps my most favorite doctrine of the Word of God is its power, and not just in its generic power, but in its specifically in the power of God's Word to give life to the soul. Only the Word of God can cause life, and only the Word of God can sustain life when we are talking about the real sense of life, spiritual life. Let me just show you that real quick. Verse 25, my soul cleaves to the dust. So here's the experience of just having inhaled a, <laughs> the sugar off of a powdered donut. You're like, I just, I'm dying this way. I'm as- asphyxiating. I'm suffocating as I try to eat this donut. And he's like, that's what I feel like spiritually. So Lord, revive me. Cause my soul to live in line with your word. The word of God causes his soul to live. It sustains life. It creates life. It generates life. If you skip over to verse 93, you see it again where he says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Where does spiritual vibrancy, spiritual life come from? What's the antidote to spiritual lethargy? What's the answer to weariness? What's the, what's the antidote to this, this ambivalence between you know, white hot and cold, spiritual passions. We find all of that answered in being revived by God's word, being revived by his precepts. Similarly, in verse 107, I'm exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Cause me to live according to your word. 149. Look at 149. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to your ordinances. Look down at the next stanza, 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Two verses later. Great are your mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your ordinances. Now, I deliberately didn't include all of the revive passages, just so you didn't think that I was over-exaggerating it. It's just everywhere. This, book, this, this psalm shows that the power of God's word is to give and sustain spiritual life and vibrancy. Now, it's all good and well to think of people in the past, Christians in the past, who've had vibrant Christian walks, and they had spiritual vibrancy. Because of this book, the question is, what about us? Do we have vibrancy, spiritual life, energy, zeal for obedience, for holiness, for God's glory in our lives? This, this psalm ought to be our psalm. It has that kind of ability. For God to give us spiritual life and energy and uh, a vivacity of, and uh, just a, a spiritual fortitude that can withstand every single trial that you have faced, are facing, and will face. You need to look no further than, than this book. And Psalm 119 tells us. But here's what I want to do. I'm excited about diving in, and it's going to be very quick, but we're going to dive in, and we're just going to limit our scope here, our focus for, for the greater part of just one little stanza. Because as I've shown you, there, the scripture, this, this psalm has so much to talk about, so many different doctrines, but there's something even more powerful about letting it speak in its own expression. In, in fact, uh, the, the, the form of this psalm, it's an, it's an acrostic, which means that it starts with the, the, the letter of the alphabet. As Omri mentioned, each stanza is the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's, it's highly formalized. The psalmist has taken a lot of time to think through the expression of worship to continue that eight lines in a row of the same, beginning with the same letter. And it's, in fact, it's kind of interesting that some commentators study the psalm and they almost walk away thinking, well, the formality kind of overshadowed the content, so really all that's driving it is what he could say with the next letter, which couldn't be farther from the truth. It's like, it's like the profundity of Jeremiah's lament when, Jer- when Jerusalem is sacked and he sits down and pens Lamentations, another famous acrostic. Each of those chapters with 22 verses, except for, of course, chapter 3 with 66, but every chapter besides chapter 3, it's 22 verses, and chapters 1, 2, and 4 just work right through the alphabet. Every line is the next letter of the alphabet. Chapter 3 Every three lines, the next letter of the alphabet. And then chapter 5 doesn't quite follow the acrostic, but it keeps the same structure of the 22-verse 
um, form. And to say that, well, he just didn't really quite capture the ache of that kind of suffering because he just stuck to the alphabet. <laughs> mm, don't think so. In fact, what's so profound is that um, it's so clearly thought through. There's an organization to it. There's a flow to it. And I think we'll be able to see that in this one psalm, I mean, in this one stanza of Psalm 119. It's called the Hay Stanza, starting in verse 33. Um, it looks like in English, it looks like the he stands up, but that's just the Hebrew letter, hey. And um, it's interesting, if you, if you were paying attention to the, the uh, reading, the Legacy Bible did a great job of bringing out, uh, you probably heard the word cause, uh, basically I think of the way, I think it, the Legacy started with cause in verse 34 all the way through for, verse 39, which is, which is great. In fact, they could have even translated 33 with a cause, and it would have said something really clunky, like, cause me to be instructed. But that would have been accurate to the Hebrew. What's interesting about this stanza is this stanza is, um, uh, b- being the hey stanza, there, there's a verb stem in the Hebrew language that starts with this letter, and it makes the verb a causative. So um, I was trying to think of what we would do in English to do this, and maybe if you add on the end of an English verb, I-Z-E, to cauterize, to caramelize, <laughs> to, you know, do whatever you do. You, 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 you torch it till the, the sugar burns and it's caramelized, right? You add I-Z-E and it just kind of, it makes it a causative type of verb. That's exactly what's happening in this stanza. And so verse 33 through verse 39, the first seven lines are hithil stem verbs. All that means is those are all verbs that are causative. The psalmist is actually appealing to God, saying, God, won't you cause something to be true in my life? This is a profound stanza of expression of dependence. In fact, it's so important that this comes so early in the, in the, in the psalm because you're going to see the psalmist say things like, cause this to be true in my life, and then you'll see later in the psalm in further stanzas that he turns right around and says, I will do this in my life. And so he's not passive about it. He is dependent. And so if your life is lacking spiritual vibrancy and vigor, if your spiritual energy is low, perhaps this stanza will be a blessing to you as an expression of dependence. Of course, if we try to live the Christian life on our own, we will quickly see our, our limit. We will qu- quickly see our inability. And this kind of dependence, this kind of desperation, it doesn't lead to, if it's, if it's prayed in faith, it doesn't lead to passivity. It leads to fruitful energy and fruitful effort for the Lord. So I titled this Prayer to the God Who is Able because every line is just dripping with conviction about God's ability and personal inability. And you can see it in all of these causative verbs. There is a structure to it. If I'm going to give you an outline of how to really emulate this psalm, I would just say this. Pray for discernment. First of all, discernment. The first two verses both have to do with discernment. And as we go through the points there, I, I have given you some, some um, points for each verse just to kind of encapsulate the whole verse. But just thinking through the stanza as a whole, pray for discernment, verses 33 and 34. Pray for sanctification, verses 35 to 38. And then pray for the outcome, verse 39, what I, 39 and 40. And what I mean, I mean by outcome is I originally was thinking fruit, but then I thought, well, fruit doesn't work because sanctification is the fruit. But what I mean by that is the outcome of having that kind of discernment and that kind of holy living, it produces an outcome in your life that the psalmist is very concerned about and he wants to protect in those prayers expressed in verses 39 and 40. So let's dive right in. This is going to be really quick. Verse 33. The idea here would be, cause me to be instructed, O Lord. So it's translated, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Cause me to be taught. He wants instruction. This is the verb form of the noun Torah. It just means to instruct. The Torah is instruction. So this is to instruct. 
And he wants to be taught. He needs to learn. He wants to learn the way of God's statutes. Statutes are the parameters for one's life, and he wants to know them. He wants to learn them. And it's not just the statutes. It's the way of the statutes. So the way means the path. And in fact, it's helpful because way occurs so many times. It occurs here. It occurs in verse 35 and, and uh, I think three times in this stanza. When you think of the word way, think of like an animal in the wild that has its little den and it has its watering hole and it walks that same route uh, every single day. It starts to wear a path. And so when it comes to paths, the scripture is very fond of using path as the course and the conduct of one's life. There's the path of the foolish, the path of the man who walks according to human wisdom. And the fool is the person who looks at the path of folly and sees the biblical warning against folly and says, yeah, that's, that leads to a really bad end. I'm not going to go all, all the way. I'm not going to go that far, but I can get on that path for the first couple of steps and then I'll jump back off. And Proverbs comes along and says, that's a fool. That's a fool who thinks you can reject truth, rely on your own wisdom, and com compute, I can totally disregard now, and three steps later, I can suddenly recover self-control when I said goodbye to that long ago. And so the fool gets on that path and doesn't realize step one leads to that end that I so desperately wanted to avoid. And the same is true on the positive side of the path of obedience. The psalmist isn't under any, con any confusion that, oh, okay, obedience looks good for three steps, and then if it gets too hard, then I can just always jump off the path. He knows that biblical obedience, there's a path. And he wants to learn the path of those statutes, and he is committed to observing it to the end. And I will say this, I think this is... Uh, better to understand the end here as the end of the path. Sometimes people take it as temporal, like the end of time, because Psalm 119 verse 112 does use it that way, but it's clear because in the Hebrew it has the word eternal, forever to the end, and so it's clearly talking about time. In this verse, it doesn't use the word forever. In fact, all it says is, teach me the way, the path of your statutes, and I'll observe it to the end. And I think he's talking about the end of the path of the statutes. He wants to follow God's instruction as far as God instructs. I don't want to stop short of full obedience. I want to go all the way as far as you have commanded me. I'm not going to stop short of that. Verse 34, if that's learning the path, verse 34 is understanding the law. And so both of these together have this robust sense of discernment that we need to be praying about. Verse 34, the psalmist says, give me understanding, cause me to understand, cause me to have insight, cause me to have discernment, cause me to discern why so that I may observe your law. Okay, pause right there. How instructive is that? The purpose of this prayer request is so that he could observe God's law. That is a prayer God answers every single time. Give me wisdom so I can be smart. Give me wisdom so I can navigate life and get the results that I want. There are so many wrong motives for seeking out wisdom. This is a spiritual discernment, a spiritual understanding that gives him the ability to truly observe God's law and, 34b, to keep it with all my heart. I mean, this is a profound request. The psalmist knows when it comes to full-hearted, passionate obedience of Christ, to obey the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, it requires robust understanding. We need to understand God's law. I need to know what he said. I need to understand his character, the nature of the promise. I need to understand. I need to know more about truth. I need to know more about God. And when you understand truth, you understand his law, you can't help but keep it with all your heart. Listen, believer. The psalmist knows that the understanding is the gateway to the heart, the volition, the will. If you really understand. And, you, and I, don't, I don't mean intellectually. You could, you could memorize Genesis through Revelation. That's not the issue. That, that would be a blessing if it's accompanied with faith. But that's not the issue. The issue is an intellectual ability to process the scriptures. 
The issue is spiritual discernment so that the law can be observed. When you understand that, you can't help but obey the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is a prayer for spiritual discernment. I kind of like to think of verse 33 and 34 as the Old Testament parallel to Romans 12 2, right? Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the NIV here, test and approve. Because Daka Mazo has the idea of the scrutiny of the testing. It goes through a refining process. And as the result of the refining process, it's not just that I know, if you refine metal, what the dross is and what's the sterling silver. I recognize the difference. It's no, you actually approve one. One gets rejected and sent out to the trash heap. The other one gets stamped, sterling silver. It, gets, it has an approval on, uh, on its label. And so for the Christian, we do not want to rest until we've so renewed our minds, until we have such a degree of understanding, not not just that we can recognize one path as being God's will and the other one not being God's will, but that we would approve of one. It's one thing to just say um, in, the Bible, in the Bible quiz, that's God's will and that's not. It's another thing for my heart, my full-hearted obedience to be embracing, that's God's will and that's what I want. I approve it. And that's what he's praying for in the connection between 34a and 34b. So those two verses are a prayer for discernment. Secondly, he starts to pray for sanctification. Flowing out of this kind of discernment and spiritual insight, he he wants a life that looks like God. He wants to live a righteous life. Verse 35, make me walk, cause me to walk. It's actually the verb form of the noun for path. It's the path and way word now turned into a verb. And so it's cause me to walk or even maybe a little bit stronger, but even cause me to trample. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like there's a victorious, triumphant aspect to this walk. It's not getting uh, dominated by unrighteousness. It's not enslaved. It's not under the dominion of unrighteousness. It's actually trampling or walking, creating a path in God's commandments. Verse 35b, because I delight in it. That's why he's praying this. That's why he's praying this. I mean, this is all over scripture, right? That our heart determines the direction of our life. Psalm 1 verse 2 The blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. What else can he do except meditate on the law day and night because he loves it, he delights in it. This this psalm is expressing the uh, tenacity that's necessary for every faithful Christian. This kind of walk that he's praying for does not happen if it's not your delight. If you don't delight in righteousness, if you don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, then you won't walk righteously. That's just a fact. That's theological fact. If you have no appetite for righteousness, you've got to ask, am I in Christ? If you have an appetite to walk like God, to look like God, to to live like God has called you to live, to put his glory on display, if possible, could God get glory from this fouled up life. That would be the climax of my existence. Without that, you'll never walk in a way that pleases the Lord. He's praying, God, make me, cause me to walk this way, not because I love passivity, and if you want to change me, great, go ahead. I'm going to sit here on the sofa with my remote control in hand. Sanctify me. If you want, Lord, do whatever you please. He's saying, make me walk because I delight in it, and I will walk that way. Read the rest of the psalm. There's so many statements. I will walk this way. I will do this. I will do that. The I wills of Psalm 119 are profound, but they start right here with cause me to do it. Cause me to do it because it's my delight. You know, the same logic is on display in Matthew 6 when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you put the highest value on is the direction of your life. And this psalmist is praying Make me walk this way because that is what he has put highest value on. He delights in a a path that is obedient to commands. 
So sanctification, first aspect is he, he's praying for a walk in obedience, walking in obedience. The second one is inclining to his word. Look at verse 36. Incline my heart. You could even translate that literally, cause my heart to bend. Cause my heart to bend. You know, it's like a picture of your heart. It's like a rigid metal, and God's even just applying such force that it just bends toward, toward what? God's testimonies. Saying, cause my heart to bend toward your testimonies. And it's interesting, you know, the progression here in these four verses in the middle about his walk or about his, um, sorry, I should say about his sanctification, his Christian life. Verse 35 is about the walk, 36 is about the heart, 37 is about the eyes, and then 38 is about the fear of the Lord. There's, there's kind of a, a progression here, starting with the most obvious aspect of just the common flow of your conduct, which is your daily conduct, which can be seen by everybody. Then he starts talking about the heart and the eyes and what, what you look at and what you think about and what you meditate on, what you love. And then fundamental to all of that is fearing the Lord, what you fear. And so here in verse 36, he's saying, would you cause my heart to bend toward your testimonies and not to gain? And I'm going to say it that way, not to gain. Why would I say it that way? Well, you notice the NAS has that in italics, because that's, that's an interpretive addition, and the word certainly can be used in context where it's uh, paralleled with bribery or greed, and so it obviously can be used for dishonest gain. However, it can also be used in several contexts in the Old Testament where it can't be used in a negative context. It wouldn't make any sense. It's just neutral, just gain, advantage, benefit, or profit, and I would want to be very clear here. The psalmist is certainly not saying that there's something wrong with profit or there's something wrong with gain as if somehow you can't provide for your kids. Uh, scripture doesn't even condemn wealth. What it does condemn is loving it. And so he says, would you cause my heart to bend towards your word, not toward gain? There's nothing wrong with having gain, but he's praying that his heart would bend toward God's word, not toward personal profit. It's kind of a good test of our heart when, as we pray this stanza, do we find ourselves thinking more about our income and more about our investments and more about our portfolio and our financial stability or security than we do about our heart bending toward his testimonies. Verse 37, averting from a vanity. Averting from vanity. Turn away. Cause my eyes to avert from looking at vanity. Vanity. Cause my eyes to not see what's vain. And we should be very clear here that the prayer is not just what is wicked and immoral, but the prayer here is what is empty. I mean, this is such a profound prayer because notice the contrast between looking at vanity is this 37b, being revived in God's ways. It's causing the soul to live in the path of obedience to the Lord. And so what prevents a vibrant Christian life? What kills spiritual life? You say, sin, of course. Of course, that goes without saying. But let's not miss what this verse is saying. More subtle and more nuanced than just sin is just vanity, emptiness. He's saying, cause my heart and my eyes to, to turn away from just what's a waste of time. I mean, it might not even be sinful, but we could squander our entire life on things that are not immoral, but amoral, just neutral. He says, I don't want to waste my life on what's amoral. Whatever we put in front of our eyes and whatever we put in front of our heart is what we tend to think about, and it consumes our life. But when you focus on the temporal, and you focus on what will be lost and you can't take with you after you die or Christ comes back, then you are focusing on what's vain. And it will kill your spiritual vibrancy. Pray verse 37. Spurgeon said of this verse, vitality is the cure of vanity. Isn't that so true? Spiritual vitality is the cure to looking at what's vain. You should pray, Lord, revive me in your ways to such a degree that those vain things, even the ones that I don't have good enough sensitivities to think about, because they just, they're not wrong, they just waste time. Could you 
revive me to such a degree that their pull on my day would be laughable? Would you revive me to that degree, Lord? Verse 38, fearing the Lord. Cause your word to stand for your servants as that which results in the fear of you. The fear of the Lord. The, 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 the fear of the Lord can only come from his word. This verse has been a bedrock for me for 20 years. This is probably, if I have a favorite verse, it would probably have to be this one. It became a prayer because I realized well, what else do I have? If I have a relationship with the Word of God and I learn all sorts of cool things, but it is not firmly and fiercely producing a reverence for the Lord, it is wasted. I mean, this is the whole point of the Word. It, it is, it is an, an, it, it's an infidelity. It's a spiritual infidelity to use the Word but in any other way but to produce a fear of God. And the psalmist just says, cause your word, cause this to be the very fulcrum which produces all fear of you. If you don't fear the Lord enough, now you know the only place you can get it. It's from his word. If you put those two prayer requests together, discernment and sanctification, it's going to have an outcome in your life. And the psalmist even prays about that in verse 39. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, He's concerned about the reproach, and reproach is always the case. If you grow in spiritual discernment and you have a holy life, you will be reproached. <laughs> Blessed are you, and all men speak ill of you for my sake, on account of righteousness, Jesus said. Um, Paul told the church uh, that you will be persecuted. Persecution is necessary to enter the kingdom. And so here in verse 39, the psalmist is aware, look, and when you answer this prayer request, Lord, to, to, to give me this discernment, and it produces a real sanctification, my walk and my eyes and my heart and my fear are all where it needs to be. My life is going to be a threat to everyone around me. I'm going to be a walking uh, confrontation. And so I'm going to get reproached coming back to me. And he's, he's saying, I dread that. He, he's not saying, I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to avoid that and not be faithful. But what he is saying is, I'm concerned about the way that reproach would come against my life as an outcome of how you might answer this prayer. What would be the, what would be the real problem here? Verse 39b, because your, ordinance, your ordinances are good. So let's just, let me just make a real quick comment here about the logic of verse 39. The psalmist knows that, look, if I follow your word and I say, here are the ordinance of, ordinances of God, he's told me how to live and I want to live that, and then somebody's watching my life, and they say, man, that guy's life just got more miserable because he is obeying the Lord. He's saying, he's not concerned about suffering for the sake of the Lord. He's concerned about the response of um, unbelief coming against him, somehow preaching a lie to others that maybe the ordinances of God really aren't that good. So he's saying, Lord, turn it away because I don't want there to be false advertising about how good your ordinances really are. I know how good they are. Show the world how good you are to those who obey you. And then verse 40, behold, I long for your precepts. This is just a simple statement of his desire. If I could, if I could produce a Tyndaleanism, he, never, he got killed before he had the chance to translate the Psalms. But I've read enough Tyndale to think, I tend to think, if he did get a chance to translate Psalm 119, he would translate verse 40, Behold, I lust for your precepts. Because Tyndale liked to use that word in the positive and the negative. It's a strong desire. And this is the conclusion of this prayer. Lord, I have this intense, strong desire, a longing, a lust, and it's, it's for your precepts. It's for your instruction. It's for the procedures that you've given as a means so that I can please and glorify and honor you. So revive me through your righteousness. Believer, do you, do you long for his precepts? Does practical righteousness revive you? This is the outcome of the, pr uh, of the prayerful dependence that's captured in this stanza. If this prayerful dependence becomes ours, we pray this with the motives described in this psalm. That's a prayer that the Lord will answer every 
single time. The discernment plus the sanctification equals the outcome of verse 39 and 40. And so what I want to do is we're, we're going we're gonna, to, before we, before we end the service, we're going to close in song. But as I pray, I actually just want to pray this stanza for us. I'm going to do my best to try to turn all of these pronouns into plurals. And uh, I'm going to pray this for all of us. So you can just keep your Bible open as, as, I, as I close in prayer before we sing our last song. And follow along uh, as I pray this out of the NAS for us this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege of reading Psalm 119 this morning. And we want to pray this stanza because this is the desire of our hearts. And certainly, Lord, in degrees, it's not the desire of our hearts. But to desire this is the desire of our hearts. And so we pray you'd accept this prayer as, as the true longing Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and we will observe it to the end. Give us understanding that we may observe your law and keep it with all our heart. Make us walk in the path of your commandments, for we delight in it. Incline our heart to your testimonies and not to gain. Turn away our eyes from looking at vanity, and revive us in your ways. Establish your word to all your servants as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away our reproach, which we dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, we long for your precepts. Revive us through your righteousness.